Okay, welcome everyone as you're joining us. This is the Emergency Preparedness for Families webinar. Thank you all for coming. Um, just a brief reminder that this um, webinar is being recorded. I would like to um, first introduce myself, I should say that. My name is Kathy Haskin and I'm with Peacock Family Services. Also with us this evening from Peacock is Zoe Greeling, our Executive Director, who is the high-tech person behind the scenes and also available during the Q&A when we get to that point of the evening. Um, I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement. If I may, Peacock operates on the land within the Aboriginal territory of the people of the Clear Salt Water, the Squamish people. We live and protect, who live and protect the land and waters of their ancestors for future generations and to whom we express our gratitude. So just a, a, some little technology notes. Um, everybody's coming in muted. Um, and certainly we will have a question and answer period toward the end and um, invite you to unmute and ask those questions. If during the presentations you have any questions, please feel free to put them into the chat. Um, both Zoe and I will be watching those, and if they're pertinent to the place in the presentation, uh, we'll bring them up, but we'll certainly visit each of those questions in due time at the end of the, um, the presentations. Um, so first of all, I should say uh, tonight's um, workshop is part of Peacock Family Services Partners for Early Learning. We do topics throughout the year and um, with different partners. Tonight our, is in collaboration with Bainbridge Repairs and our partners there, longstanding partners, I might add. Um, those of you who are not familiar with Peacock, we are a nonprofit um, uh, founded in 2009. Um, and our vision is that all of the children of uh, Kitsap County reach their full potential, nurtured by families and caregivers who feel supported, informed, and connected. And so part of that is what we're doing tonight. We're um, hopefully connecting some people, connecting them to a topic, and helping you feel more empowered with um, your role in our children's lives. Um, we, as Peacock, also have um, a child care center, um, toddlers, preschool, pre-K, um, that program has been longstanding since we started. Um, we also have a school age program, which is Nature Nuts, which is kindergarten through third grade. Right now they're an after school program. We pick them up at school, take them out to the parks and they reap all the benefits of the outdoor learning. And then during school breaks, like summer or the winter breaks and such, we do day camps. And so that Nature Nuts is a great program um, as, as well. Um, you know about our workshop series and our other program that we've been running since 2015 is our ABCD. It's Alliance of Bainbridge Childcare Directors. And it is a great group. We have uh, just over 24 different centers um, in our listserv for that. We meet throughout the calendar years, a lot of networking. Definitely got us through um, the pandemic <laughs> with all of the best practices and sharing um, that we had. So um, this evening is a great fit for Peacock because our core values are community, health, and inclusiveness. And so tonight we'll have with us Scott James, who is the founder of, and Scott, if you can open your um, first slide, that would be great timing. Sure. Um, he's the founder of Bainbridge Repairs. He's also the board chair. Um, he's here to share uh, a lot of the information about what is Bainbridge Prepares and our efforts in the community. And then also with us today is Megan, Megan Skolheim, who is the head of school at M Montessori Country School here on Bainbridge Island. And she is also a longstanding member of the Bainbridge Prepares Child Safety and Reunification Team. Um, and so she'll um, share a lot about the specific topics of that. And... Um, so I, oh, I forgot to mention, I'm so sorry. Part of the, part of us wanting to do this tonight is because Rotary Club um, supported Peacock's emergency preparedness efforts through a grant. And so this is our in-kind support. They helped us a lot with um, setting up what we needed um, with our programs. And so we wanted to do this outreach um, for ourselves and, and Rotary's efforts too. Um, so, um, Without further ado, Scott, <laughs> why 
I'll leave thank it to you. you. All right. Thank you so much, Kathy. Appreciate it. Um, this evening, we'll go, we'll go through a, a couple of uh, primary topics. First, who are we? What, what is this famous repairs organization that um, is getting set up to take care of your kiddos uh, post-disaster? Uh, and then um, we'll get into some specifics about um, family reunification and the, the importance of that and um, our child reunification center and the plans to do that so that you know what's going on uh, as a parent or guardian um, post-disaster. So uh, first, a little bit about us. Um, if it is a normal emergency where 911 would respond, that's not us. <laughs> so um, really, you will hear me say the word earthquake about 400 times um, over the next hour or so. Uh, that's kind of shorthand for anything, any type of natural disaster that is a large bioregional disaster. What this means is that um, mutual aid that we would normally have from, say, the rest of North Kitsap County or even the greater Seattle area is not available because they are experiencing the same natural disaster. So we are all overwhelmed. All of our professionals are overwhelmed. That's when Bainbridge Repairs and the team that we have created um, activates. There's, uh, you'll see in the middle there, there's some um, aspects where we do activate um, uh, because we've been requested to do so. Um, for instance, the pandemic, um, the only silver lining that I could find out of that tragedy was that it, um, it gave us a stress test of the organization we had built um, and it worked. You know, the, the first day of, that they closed City Hall and they turned it into the Emergency Operations Center we stood up about 60-70% uh, of our teams that instantly gave the emergency manager and um, two, 300 people, uh, background checked, qualified people, uh, that uh, citizens like you and I, that were all ready to go. So this is who, when you, when you hear around town, uh, Bainbridge Repairs, it's really, most of the time it's referring to this three-way partnership we've created. It's, um, we've got a community nonprofit. We are a 501c3. Um, supported um, solely uh, by donation dollars, frankly. I think that we get about 12 grand a year from the city and that's it. Um, so this is truly a citizen driven um, entity that we started in 2011. The other partners in this are the fire department. They have been our partner from day one, uh, literally month one of in 2011. Um, the previous chief gave us the thumbs up and has given us strong support ever since then. And then the city joined us about six, seven years ago, um, uh, which has also been a, an enormous uh, help, particularly because we have that embodied in the dynamo that is Anne LeSage, our emergency management coordinator. She's an amazing. She's like an army of one that has been supported by over 750 people like you and I, who are citizens that have gone through the background check. They've gone through multiple or uh, multiple levels of training, depending on their interest. Um, and the system works. Um, you can see that little icon down at the bottom of that little badge. Uh, it works well enough that there's a whole group of international emergency managers, people like our own Anne LeSage. So just think very type A, very fast forward people from around the world. Um, and they uh, gave us an award and said, you're the best nonprofit we've seen uh, a couple of years ago. So that was... Um, that was good verification that we were on the right track, that we were doing the right thing. Now, of all of the teams that you see listed on here, and there's a lot, um, we are gonna focus on one team uh, this evening, and that's the one that's most important to um, your kiddos. And that is the child safety and reunification team that you see in the lower right-hand corner. Um, those teams operate out of something that is, uh, will be created post-earthquake at the high school. Um, you know that brand new building, the newest building we've got, Building 100? Um, the uh, school district was kind enough cons to consult with us during the, the architecture phase of that. It was built specifically so that it could become, serve as um, this type of disaster hub that's focused on kids post-earthquake. Um, it is. It will be staffed by a bunch of folks that uh, our team lead, Kari and Megan and the rest of that crew have recruited. And these are people that go through the same background check as a new police officer. It's the deepest background check you can get. Um, and they have also uh, been trained uh, on how to deal with uh, kids, uh, particularly the, the, the younger ones, the littles. 
Uh, the rest of this map you'll see, so disaster hubs, the Child Reunification Center is, is in essence a kid-focused disaster hub. Um, we created disaster hubs. I borrowed concepts for probably half a dozen different towns across the country when studying this for a book that I was writing. We put all those things together into something that's unique. Um, and then we have recruited all of the folks that you see listed here um, to say, hey, Lodell Reserve, um, you have a lovely spot up north. And whether you like it or not, post-earthquake, people are going to walk to your campus. Uh, They're looking for answers. They're looking for potentially medical uh, care. And they just want to get away from um, big giant trees. So we recruited places that we knew psychologically people would automatically be walking to anyway for more information. Uh, you'll see listed here the types of things that are are at a disaster hub. Um, I'll just be blunt and tell you what's not there. What is not there is food and water for entire neighborhoods full of people. Um, we very much expect our neighborhoods to take care of ourselves through our Map Your Neighborhood program. Uh, I'll show you a slide on that at the very end. But um, this is about citizens helping to take care of citizens. This is residents taking care of each other because the math doesn't work if we're gonna rely on our first responders. We're a, we're a town of about 24,000 um, residents. And uh, at any given time, we've got about a dozen first responders on this island between police, fire, and some trained city staff, a dozen. That math doesn't work. We're getting closer to the making the math work by you know 750 plus trained volunteers. Sure. Uh, that starts to get uh, going in the right direction. So you'll see that the disaster hubs is where a lot of the trained citizens get together uh, to form that is the basis of the neighborhood support, neighborhood by neighborhood by neighborhood. One other thing I'll mention about disaster hubs before we move on, um, the primary purpose of this thing or the number one use that we're forecasting is as a, almost like a matchmaking service. Earthquakes are so weird and we've got awesome science and even better, we have some of the smartest seismologists in the world in our backyard at UW. And thankfully, because we're close, we get to work with them a lot. But they can't predict that one street will come out of the earthquake just fine and the street two streets over it just got decimated. And there's not a way to predict that. The hub is meant for both of those streets to walk in and for one street to say, we got through just fine. The other street to say, we have nothing left but rubble. And guess what? These folks are going to go live with these folks for the next month while we uh, get to a new normal. It, that's the way uh, neighbors can take care of neighbors. So Megan, can you walk us through two of these documents that folks can find on the website? Sure. Uh, by the way, the, the website that you guys will wanna to go to is bainbridgeprepares.org slash kids. That's where you'll find everything that Megan and Kari and their team have put together for you all. Sure, I thought I would start by letting you know what the child reunification team actually is. So it's a group made up of um, representatives from the public school, from child care centers, from the private schools on the island, uh, from the nursery schools on the island. And then also we're, um, we have connections with uh, coaches and people from the parks department, anywhere that your child might be when they're not with you. And what we want to do is work hard to make sure that everyone who's taking care of children during that time knows what to do in an earthquake. I'm personally very inspired to do this work by the knowledge that what we've learned from other places in this country that didn't have any kind of plan in place and where children were basically left on their own in some instances. So um, I'm, I'm particularly proud to be a part of this group and be a part of all the planning that's gone into it. So we first started by creating a list of all the supplies that schools and childcare centers need to have on hand. And we're all still working on that. It's a lot to think about having food and water and blankets and um, everything that they might need for the first 48 hours. At my school, at Montessori Country School, we have about 120 children. So we're prepared to keep, take care of them for the first 48 hours after a disaster. And other schools have the same thing in place. Um, and then the rest of our time has been spent planning for this event, how we're going to manage it, and also events like this where we hope to get the word out to parents and make sure that parents are um, 
aware of our plan and know um, what's going to happen. So on the purple sheet over there, the child reunification emergency plan basically goes through the first 48 hours after a major disaster. Um, I'll just say about my school, we'll, we will just immediately assess the safety and health of the children and the safety of the buildings. And then we're going to gather everyone together and our job will be to keep the children safe and happy and fed and comforted until they're picked up by a parent or another um, adult or family friend designated by the parent. Um, we will have a separate space, which is where we release children. And it's important that you know the plan of your particular school so that you know what to do uh, when this earthquake occurs or when this um, major disaster occurs. Um, as an example, at my school, we're going to have all the children in one space, but we don't want frantic parents running into that space to grab their children. So we have a separate space where parents will go and we will bring your child to you um, at the country school. So it's really important that you know what your individual school's plans are and help them out by following those plans. Um, the other way that you can help um, during this time is to be sure that you've filled out all the paperwork that the schools have asked for. So most schools and childcare centers will ask you to have a form that has um, people who are designated to pick your child up in an emergency. And it can be your neighbor. Um, it's really important that you have someone within walking distance of where your child is too, because our assumption of course, is that as Scott said, with all of our big, beautiful trees, some of them are gonna go down across the roads. And the idea of getting in your car and driving to pick up your child is probably not possible. So um, if there's someone nearby who can walk and pick up your child, and if they're on our list, that is our main goal is to get all of the children away from the school into homes of people they know. Um, let's see, uh, the other really important part of that, that is that you need to let the people who you put on the list know that you've put them on the list so that they're not surprised when they show up and we're going to say, hey, we're going to give you these four children to take home. Um, and so it's really good to talk with people about that. It's also really important that among those people on your list that you um, have a plan to help to communicate with each other post incident because there will be no cell phones. And that's something that you need to remember. Most of those um, hubs or some of those hubs will have ham radio operators, but they're going to be talking to each other about major things. So you need to be able to have a plan with the people you know and love around you um, that will say where, um, how, how you're going to reconnect and know where your children are if they've picked them up. Um, and let's see. We're going to do that for the first 48 hours. And then on the 49th hour, we're going to see which children we have left at our various centers or schools. And we're going to get all of their information with them. We have um, emergency, all their emergency forms, if they have medications, things like that. We're going to pack them all up and we're going to make our way to the high school. So my school is across the street from the main entrance to Battle Point Park, and we're going to walk to the high school. We imagine it's going to take us a long time. We're going to take our time. We're going to rest. But the goal um, after the first 48 hours is to go to the Child Reunification Center at the high school. So there you are on the purple sheet down at the bottom. And once we get there, we're going to check all those kids in. And um, we're going to stay with the kids from our school. Someone from Montessori Country School will be staying with the children from Montessori Country School. And I believe that that's how all of the other schools and preschools on the island are, are working to make sure that kids know, know somebody there and know someone who they feel comfortable with. Um, and then staff may rotate during that time, depending on what the state of the island is and how many people can get here. I think it's really important to keep in mind that the Agate Pass Bridge will probably go down in an earthquake, which means that even if you go to Costco, you need to have this in, in place, this plan in place, and know that it's going to take a few days if both parents are off island to get back on island. There are people who will start running boats, but um, for a while, 
it's going to be hard to get back onto the island, which is a, another big reason why this is all in place. Okay, so schools prepare by doing practice drills all the time. Uh, we prepare by having all of our supplies stocked and ready to go. And then we practice on our in-service days what our roles are going to be. Who's going to take care of the children? Who's going to let them go? And who you're going to talk to? And who's going to be out there to help parents know what to do? Um, I think one of the bigger questions for everyone is how you talk to your child about this, and it really depends on the age of the child. So for those children who are toddler, three and four-year-olds, really they have adults around them who need to take care of them. And the adults around them will be talking to them when it happens and helping them to find safe spaces to be. As your child is um, an older four-year-old, five, six, heading up into the elementary age, it's really good to practice. And we talk at our school a lot, and I would encourage you to practice at home. When the ground shakes, we don't know when this might happen, but it will shake, and we're going to find safe places to be in our home and practice that. Maybe see if your whole family can fit under the dining room table or where are the safe areas in your house that you're going to go during an earthquake and then just practice it with the idea that we're getting prepared and we're going to be safe and we're going to be here to take care of each other. And if you're not here at home, you will be with other adults who know how to take care of you and keep you safe. Um, I think that the group of um, children who need the most um, conversations about communication, et cetera, are going to be our middle school and high school children. And they may think that they can rely on their cell phones to let their parents know where they are, but you really need to have a plan with your kids if you have kids who are older, because they can probably leave school, um, especially the high school kids, and you're gonna wanna know where they are and they're gonna wanna know where you are. So the form on the right, the emergency reunification plan is a form on the website. And we encourage you to copy it off and fill it out at home and put it on your refrigerator. And it's a great thing to do as a family. Um, so who, who are the people that we wanna be sure that we check in with? Who's someone out of state that we all know that if we get separated, we're all going to call Aunt Mary in Idaho and tell her where we are, get in touch with her um, so that she can be the contact person or something like that. And then again, who are the local people that we that we would feel comfortable with um, picking up our children and that your children know, oh, if, if the neighbor Joe shows up, it's okay for you to go home with him so that you have this list of people. And then of course, where meeting spots might be, especially if your children are older, um, right outside and then in the neighborhood and in downtown Winslow or King County or, or wherever um, you wanna keep spreading out so that your family knows where to go. You can even have copies of these and fold them up and put them in your older kids' backpacks so that they can have them with them in the event that this happened and they can remember what this is. Um, and let's see, I don't have a lot more here. I'm ready, we could talk, um, have questions. There are books out there. If you wanna read a book with your kids, we read with our preschool kids, a, a book called When the Ground Shakes. And it's just, it's just an easy, reassuring book that tells kids what, how it feels. It usually lasts about 15 seconds. It might last longer, sing your favorite song and then um, go someplace safe, like under a table where um, you can wait out the shaking. Um, and then there are other books as children get older that talk about um, kids who are able to find their way around and get back to their families and know how to keep themselves safe during an earthquake. Um, the other important part um, for you to remember is just that after 48 hours, um, don't try to get to your child's school or child care center or um, soccer team practice. You should know that they've all been taken to the high school on the island. And when they get to the family reun reunification center on the island, there will be people there um, who are trained medical people and there are trained psychological people psychological health people there, in addition to all of us who um, work in the schools and the child care centers and coach the teams who will be there to be with your children. 
before we leave this slide, yeah. Megan, I um, wanted to call it one specific thing that, that Megan had mentioned. If you look over on the right-hand side on the family reunification, the emergency reunification plan, um, note that I've got two um, off-island meeting spots that I want you all to have, one on the Kitsap County side and one on the King County side. The reason for that is you never know. Um, you might be visiting a friend downtown Seattle. You could be on your way to the airport. You might be over in Silverdale going shopping. You might work either direction or be part of a faith-based group either direction. Um, when the earthquake happens, the bridge will almost assuredly become impassable if it's, if it's even still standing. Um, and here's a bitter pill uh, that you're gonna have to swallow. We've all chosen to live on a beautiful island. Guess what? From the latest science, um, we're not going to be able to get back to that island for a minimum of one week. That's a minimum of one week. That's not a couple of days later. It is the setch effect, the sloshing effect of the bathtub effect of, you know, when our kids are in, in bathtubs and they're making a complete mess. Um, that water the, from the tsunami and the earthquake uh, it goes up and down for several days. It does not settle back down. And what the Coast Guard has told us is they're not even going to send out their big breaker boats to even take a look at the condition of the water until day four, five, or six. Now, once they send their boats out to see the condition of the water, that's still no guarantee that we've, we've created a flotilla. We're currently at 85 captains strong, but we can't release them until the Coast Guard says, yeah, you can go out and not have your boat uh, destroyed within a matter of hours. So... It's crucially important that when you find a place off island in both both sides of the island, that that is a place that you can um, take refuge for a minimum of one week. Um, second thing I wanted to mention was Megan talked a little bit about some of our older children. Um, uh, our our team lead for this team, uh, Kari Murphy, she uh, in her day job she is the uh, she writes all the curriculum for the Girl Scouts for like the whole Pacific Northwest region. She's like the grand poobah of Girl Scouts. And she's here on this island. We're lucky to have her. Um, she will readily tell you stories that most of our Scouts, most of particular our Girl Scouts, uh, they're more well-trained than most adults on this island. Frankly, if you have a couple of 14-year-old um, Scouts with you in your neighborhood, uh, you're going to be in much better shape than if you didn't. So... There comes a point where the kiddos, even though we might think of them as kiddos, they are still fully capable young adults with skills, with training, with badges, where they have gone through um, some of these survival and um, uh, uh, emergency preparedness uh, skill sets. So don't underrate, underrate them, but have that conversation. If you've got younger ones who have older siblings, it's particularly crucial that the older siblings know, um, are they expected to stay at the high school? Um, where do you want them to go and have that conversation with them as a, as a young adult. Can, um, we, or can we also speak to just uh, supplies? I know uh, schools will have supplies on hand for those first two days, but what could be in your car or the kids' backpacks or um, your gym bag? Perfect tee up. So um, next steps are preparing um, yourself for your home and your vehicles. Uh, and then, that's your immediate next step. Your one after that is, is preparing with your neighborhood and then being part of the, the greater community preparedness. Um, as Kathy just mentioned, um, having gear is important. But I will tell you, frankly, having studied this around the world and worked on this for a long time, um, gear is important, relationships are more important, particularly relationships that matter when life becomes very local very quickly, which is what happens after an earthquake. Um, your Facebook friends are uh, relatively worthless because they're on the other side of the country. Um, if you live up on the north end of the island, even your friends on the south end of the island are not super helpful because it takes a long time to walk across our island. Um, that's why I was making re reference on your top 10 list of people who are authorized to pick up your kiddo. Make sure that those folks um, ideally live near you. If you live way up north and your best friend lives way down south, you might consider not actually having your best friend on that list unless you are willing to, to know you need to walk all the way down south to get that kiddo. It might be more advantageous to have a neighbor listed to get your child back to the neighborhood. That's your decision. But just keep in mind, we are walking 
Um, best case scenario, you're bicycling, but they, we've got lots of fallen trees down um, for several weeks after that earthquake. So gear is important. Um, I, we have lists on our website. I think it's bandwidthrepairs.org slash gear, I believe it is, or slash checklist. Um, before you go out and buy a bunch of stuff, I would prefer you to do your map your neighborhood meeting. Um, otherwise, you end up buying stuff that you actually don't need because your neighbor has it. And frankly, everybody in your neighborhood doesn't need a chainsaw. You know, you need like one chainsaw per neighborhood and a person who knows how to use it without cutting off their kneecaps. Um, there is things that you do need individually, the things that you would want to keep stored in your vehicle so that you had it with it. If you work uh, or spend a lot of time off island, you would have want to have a get home bag, which is a bag that has items that you would get home one last time. Um, in particular, that would include sensible shoes. If you were wearing dress shoes to work, um, you know what? You look great, but you do not want to be walking home uh, for miles and miles and miles in those shoes. So put a pair of good hiking shoes or walking shoes in that get home bag. Um, so you'll find those lists on our website. Uh, but again, it, before you go do that, what I'd prefer you to do is look at your uh, map your neighborhood program. So map your neighborhood. Um, this is a national program that was actually created here in Washington state, Dr. Luann Johnson. Um, she did a great job with it. And then a bunch of other states have picked up versions of it or, um, or recreated it for their state. Uh, Luann was one of the first ones to do it. Um, we are about 55% um, mapped on our island. 55% of the homes have gone through this type of thing. What it is, is it is a social event. We are big believers in preparedness through partying. So this is invite your immediate neighbors over for a party. Wine and cheese, have a three hour conversation. By the way, we're gonna take 30 minutes of that three hours and we're gonna talk about taking care of each other and checking on each other post natural disaster. It does not need to be scary. Um, we have a team of a dozen trainers who would come out and actually lead the conversation for you if you want to be the host. Um, and then it enables you to start to have some of these connections to, oh, okay, if I'm off island, who's taking care of my kiddos? If they get brought back to the neighborhood, who's going to be taking care of them? How is that going to happen? Same thing applies to um, some of our beloved elders. If you've got elderly parents that live with you. Um, same type of thing applies. So uh, Map Your Neighborhood is also, you'll find that on our website. Um, that's a good first step to do with your maximum 20 closest neighbors. Um, less is more typically uh, for this one. And what that does is that also gives you an, an instant sense of security, because remember how important relationships are. We will be um, basically living um, in groups post-earthquake for several weeks to several months um, and uh, in close cooperation with each, with each other. And frankly, our town is set up for that. I mean, we are classic small town America. Um, if you don't know your neighbor already, you'll be pleasantly surprised to get to know these amazing people. Um, every time I go to a Map Your Neighborhood party, uh, that's the primary comment that I hear as I'm leaving. And they are all still talking with each other very excitedly is they had no idea that two doors down was a retired nurse or two doors the other way is a structural engineer that's going to be able to look at each home and say we shouldn't go into that one and this one's okay there's just a wealth of relationships that we can have um, on our island and it speaks to a theme that Megan and I uh, uh, and the rest of the the core leadership that Bainbridge Repairs talks a lot about which is we look at natural preparedness and community preparedness for natural disasters um, through a lens of love, not fear. You can look at this through fear and you can get scared. And, and a lot of states, actually, other areas use that as a scare tactic to get you to act. It doesn't stick. It might get you to act quickly, but it doesn't stick. And more importantly, it creates a town you don't really want to live in. So we're flipping that out on its head. We're doing a judo move and we're saying, no, we're going to look at this through community building and love rather than fear. Even if the earthquake doesn't happen for another 50 years, we have built a stronger, more closely knit social safety uh, net within our island. Uh, so it makes the town more enjoyable to live in. 
So um, with that, we will open it up for uh, questions. Um, yes, we have a question that just popped um, on the chat. Uh, Jennifer is asking if the cell phones are down, how will we be able to call someone out of state? And that also lends to how are all these hubs going to be able to talk to each other? And where's the communication that we can rely on? So we have several layers. Um, Ham radio was mentioned, that is our core backbone layer. Every one of our hubs, plus the emergency operations center, plus some of our mobile teams are all, all have ham operator uh, assigned to them. So part of the team that walks in, including the one that's gonna go to the child reunification center are ham radio operators. So that is the core that's not, it's, it's not interruptible. Um, we've got backup generators <clears throat> and they're walking in the equipment. Uh, it's, uh, it's relatively bulletproof. That's one layer. There's a second layer, which is the physical layer of runners. <laughs> and uh, all of our teenagers are gonna, who are gonna have an awful lot of energy and nothing to do because life uh, has basically ground to a halt. And um, I don't, all the kids, I've got a teenager, right? They, all the ones I know are outstanding kids. Um, so we have got physical runners uh, that are gonna jump on their bicycles as a secondary backup uh, beyond ham. The third is a technical, it's the opposite, is a very high-tech solution, which is um, when Starlinks came out a few years ago, that became a game changer for us. Starlink is a, uh, if you're not familiar, it's a new type of satellite dish, um, relatively affordable. I will put relatively in air quotes there, um, but it goes straight from the connection at your house, the dish at your house up to a satellite. So other than an EMP, that also cannot be interrupted. Um, earthquake will not be able to touch that as long as those units have power. So what I've encouraged our tech ops team to do is to create an island-wide mesh network based off of Starlinks. Um, so Starlinks keep us connected to the internet. Um, the traffic will be prioritized. You will not be able to watch cat videos. Uh, uh, but uh, we will be able to prioritize traffic um, based off of like re reunification. Now, related to that is another game changer, which is more recent. Starlinks came out a few years ago. We That radically changed our communications plan. Um, Apple, uh, maker of iPhones, recently announced that um, the iPhones are going to stop pinging directly to cell towers, which are on land, which earthquakes can knock over. Uh, they're going to go straight to the satellite. So uh, in another two years, we might have the same conversation and I might be able to wave my hand and say, 50% of you all who are on iPhones already talk directly to a satellite for emergencies. You don't even need to go through a Starlink mesh network. Um, it, the phone will still work for emergencies. Um, I don't know if the Android side of that universe, of our cell phone universe, has got similar plans, but this is a really good thing for those of us who've chosen to live on an island, uh, is to see technology moving that direction. You can learn more about that um, on our tech ops page, bainbridgerepairs.org uh, slash uh, tech ops, T-E-C-H-O-P-S. Other questions? Anyone feel free to unmute and ask what you're curious about. Um, one question I, I hear a lot is what what should we have in our car? Uh, what should we have with us other than the get home bag? Um, so um, if we go back to the uh, rule of threes, uh, let's see here, let me go backwards. Um, this emergency plan, you'll uh, you'll notice in the lower right-hand corner, um, here I'll go back to the one that's a little bit larger, for self-care. So this is agreements that, that I want you to have. At, at, it's just a calm dinner conversation, you know, 20 minutes with the family. Um, is the backpacking rule of threes, uh, for those of you who like going out to the Olympics, you're probably already familiar with this. The hu A human being can survive three hours um, before... You, when you're cold and wet before you really need to go find shelter and get dry. We can survive for three days um, without water, albeit un uncomfortably, particularly in day two and three. And then we can survive for three weeks without food. 
Now, that is not how we normally think about it. Normally we think, oh my God, I got to go buy a bunch of food and put it in my trunk. Um, I'm going to be so hungry. No, you don't. Uh, buy a few snack bars. But really what I want you to focus on is doing the rule of threes in that order. Make sure you have the ability in a little duffel bag in your vehicle that you can get dry and then stay dry. Uh, then have water so that you need to be drinking so that you can make good decisions. Otherwise, one of the main um, problems with dehydration is, is not the actual dehydration, it's dehydration, and then you might start to make dumb decisions. And then you get yourself into a world of hurt, uh, not based off of the dehydration, but because you've made a bit poor decision. Um, so uh, water is a key thing. As I said earlier, sensible shoes um, that are not dress shoes. Uh, if you are coming back from uh, faith-based service or work where you're all dressed up, uh, make sure you've got shoes you can actually walk and, and hike in. Uh, and then um, remember that we live far enough north uh, that you, you remember what our winters are like as winter is coming. You know, it's dark at four and it's still dark at 8 a.m. when we, the kids go to school. So uh, headlamps, you know, something that you can keep yourself hands free um, so that you got a kid in one arm and you've got a bag in the other. Uh, but headlamps are also particularly useful. The other thing you can do is, um, uh, as you, this is true for the shoes as well, but as you age out of, say, a pair of shoes that are still okay, but if instead of giving them away, you might consider um, tucking those into the trunk of your car. Same for jackets. Uh, um, and particularly with littles. So when my two kiddos were younger, I felt like I was changing out the car kit every six months, especially during growth spurts. Because um, you don't want to pull out a jacket that is four sizes too small because you forgot to update it in the last two years and those kids grow so fast. Um, so for the rest of the car kit, uh, you can look at the rest of our our list, but those are some of the basics is you want to be able to see, you want to be able to drink water so you make good decisions and you want to stay dry and warm. I think the other one I would add to that, Scott, is having um, a couple of days worth of medication with you for if you or your child needs medication. Yes, and since this audience, since we're talking about the littles, um, if you're still in diapers, that's relatively crucial uh, as well. You'll but, look on our gear list and it's got some specific stuff for if you have little kids, make sure you add these. If you've got pets, make sure you add these. If you've got a, a senior that's living with you, add these. And if I can um, take off of the, the comment about um, medications and such, um, if Megan, can you speak to how um, children will be checked in and identified, say, if they're allergic to nuts, if sure. there's something they should be paying attention to when they get there? Yeah. So when we get ready to go to the Family Reunification Center, we're going to have uh, Tyvek bracelets for all the children where we will write their names. Um, and then at country school, as an example, we have emergency forms that are all folded up into a plastic bag with a safety pin that we pin on the back of the child as we start to walk to the high school. We will also have red Tyvek bracelets that would have on them if the child has an allergy or a medication. And when we get to the Family Reunification Center, there will be people from the medical team there who are designated to be with the children. And so we will make sure that we check in with those people and let them know, you know, this child has these medications or these allergies or, um, you know, needs um, their insulin shots or whatever those things are, that there will be um, medical people on site at the Family Reunification Center, and they will have a special way to um, sign those kids in to make sure that the doctors and nurses know about them. And that includes any other um, special needs. Um, yes. It's so important that those teachers are doing, you know, the introduction into that space to bring all of the knowledge that they have about what might make this child more nervous or what might make them more comfortable. And we will be, uh, our plan is to keep children basically by age, but sometimes they have, might have an older sibling. So we will also be working to unite siblings um, uh, when we get there. So if there's a child from a preschool who happens to have an elementary sibling who goes to a different school, 
we're going to work to make sure that we can put those kits together um, when we get there. One note on that child reunification centers, you might be asking, well, who are these people that are going to be working with and watching over my kiddo? Well, the answer is us, including you. So consider yourself invited. Um, if you go to bandwidthrepairs.org slash volunteer, that is the portal for um, onboarding. You can see the types of background checks that you'd need to go through. And then there's lots of other training in addition to that. But again, this is this is citizens taking care of each other to free up our first responders to take care of the core infrastructure of the island. Um, so if, uh, if this strikes a passion point with you, we would love to have you join our ever-growing crew uh, of really cool people. Um, particularly if uh, working at the CRC, the Child Unification Center is of interest to you. Other questions, quick time check. How are we? 720. Yeah. I did put on in the chat um, the links to both of these um, emergency plan sheets. Um, and you can also find them on the, on the Bainbridge Prepares website as well. Megan, you noted another book in the chat. Um, I yeah, see. there's a series of books that we read to our elementary students. We read it aloud, but um, early readers can read it. It's called I Survived the Alaska Earthquake. And um, that was just something about, uh, you know, a 10-year-old kid who was in an earthquake. It's based on the Alaska earthquake that happened in the 60s. But we found it to be a good book of kids um, weathering the the emergency and then getting back to their family and and what that was like. So. Those are the two that I've found that I like the uh, when the ground shakes for preschool to age children. And then I survived the Alaska earthquake for elementary. So a quick question. Um, is there anything that would be helpful um, from your point of view for us to have um, in our kids' backpacks? Should they be sort of coming to the reunification center? Like, should we have a laminated who their contacts are or anything else like that? I would say yes, that form um, in, uh, you know, put in a, a clear plastic sleeve of some sort, fold it up in, mm -hmm. in their backpacks, because it's hard to remember all of that when you're in mm -hmm. a time of stress. And also it's really helpful. Um, you know, we've talked about as an example, you know, we're going to have kids at the family reunification center who are on a bus who were at a game in Seattle and they're trying to get home to Paulsbo and the earthquake happened. So we're going to have kids that we don't have within our school systems. So, um, you know, it's really great for your kids to have that information on hand in their backpacks. And um, the schools all have hard copies of these forms, but um, still, I would I would certainly encourage that. Mm -hmm. Kristen, you might also consider um, mm -hmm. adding some items that are, are comfort items. So if they've mm -hmm. got a favorite snack bar, pop that into the Ziploc bag. If there is a really fun photo of the family all together with the pets, put that in mm -hmm. um, the... Uh, the item there and then if then there can be some additional things that you might that might be particularly important to you um uh that could also be useful to uh to the school you know um mm. there's life straws which are these straws that have a built-in water filtration system you can literally stick them in the pond and suck up water out of it and it's potable mm. <clears throat> um there's a, a variety of smaller things that are that are pretty useful um mm. When I started Baymarsh Repairs, my kiddos, I think we're still at MCS with, with Megan and her crew. And um, if I remember, I made a mistake the first time I thought, I'm going to, I've, I've got emergency whistles on each of the backpacks for when we go out in the Olympics. I'm going to put an emergency whistle in the Ziploc for my kids. <laughs> I think it was either Megan or she was very kind about it, but she said, please don't put that ear splitting <laughs> emergency whistle in the Ziploc and then tell your child, hey, it's in there. You can just get it out anytime you want. <laughs> if you no need class. help, anytime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we have letters of comfort at the country school 
And um, one of the people at the Bainbridge Repairs Group told a story. She grew up in California, and she said at the high school, they found out who had people who had written letters of comfort and who didn't. And as students, they wrote letters to those who had not had letters written for them by family members. Mm -hmm. And she said it meant a huge thing to people when the earthquake actually happened, that there was some letter of comfort there from someone who just said, you know, I care about you, we'll be there, we'll be okay. And those are letters that we plan to have with the child and read to them. So something like that is is also really helpful. You know, reassuring, you're with people who care about you and we're on our way and we're gonna come see you soon. Something along those lines. I'd encourage you all to share what you're doing with your principal, with your director, with your head of school. Um, we're working kind of from top down <clears throat> with all the principals, vice principals, all the HOS, the heads of schools, um, and the executive directors. But it does not hurt at all for them to also hear from their parent and guardian community from grassroots up. Hey, by the way, this is what is in you know my kiddo's backpack and why. Uh, so it, it reaffirms um, uh, the because they also do a lot of behind the scenes planning that we as the parent community don't hear about or that you might miss it in the newsletter because there's 40 other items in the newsletter um, that that head of school uh, has done a lot of work on. Other questions? Okay. Yeah. Well, with that, uh, Kathy, did you say you had a wrap-up slide? Yes, I do. If I can... Let me stop sharing so that you can share your wrap-up slide. Um... And did we get everything out of the chat? I just realized I was in full screen and not looking at the chat. I believe so. The, um, there was one mention to the reiteration of um, when looking at the uh, what's in the backpack to have the list of medications and things like that. The important kind. Oh, and Kathy, that one question I'm seeing that on the, if, about being able to call somebody out of state, um, yeah. uh, it's important to have that out of state contact or out of region contact for a couple of reasons. Um, one, when the cell phones do work again, or if you are on a newer iPhone, um, or you can do a Wi-Fi call through our island wide mesh network where we're making, uh, it's important to have that person because a lot of times what we've seen in other natural disasters is it's easier to make a phone call far away than it is to make one locally because the local cell towers are so inundated and local um, technology is so inundated. So it's easier for two people to call down to Portland, for instance, than it is to call across from one side of Seattle to the other. So I'm sure everyone's going to have more questions. Um, and you'll, you'll think of them, you know, 10 minutes after we all sign off, but um, feel free um, to uh, shoot a note. You all got my email um, with the link to this webinar and you're welcome to send it to me and I'll, I'll get you to the right person for the right answers. Um, but thank you all for coming. Uh, really appreciate it. We'll also put this recording out. So if you would like to share it with others, feel free to do so. I believe um, we may put it up on um, a website or maybe Bainbridge Prepares or Peacocks. Um, and I have, is my sh screen showing up? It doesn't show up for me. Yes. Yes. And so our, our two different um, websites, if you need them. Um, also want to thank, obviously, um, Bainbridge Prepares and Montessori Country School um, and um, Rotary for being there and the, the catalyst for getting us to get this together. Um, we also have business sponsors, uh, Charter Real Estate and Island Fitness. Um, but we also invite everyone to just keep this communication going. If you want to be part of Bainbridge Prepares, um, that step that Scott um, alluded to on the website is very easy to step through and it is a great program to be part of. It's a great community. Um, and then if you, you just want to support our work in other ways, um, being nonprofits, we appreciate you thinking of us at your end of year um, gifting and uh, through one call for all. So with that, I thank you all. Um, unless somebody just has that burning question that you thought of before you uh, we hang out. Appreciate it. And thank you, Scott. Thank you, Megan. Um, yeah. Zoe behind the scenes keeping us running and <laughs> yes, thank you, Zoe. It, it was definitely um, 
a wealth of knowledge in a short amount of time. Very Thank good. you all. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you.